Okay, let's get started. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Sherrod Thaxton. I'm an assistant professor of law here at UCLA, as well as a core member of the Critical Race Studies faculty. I admit it's an unenviable pa uh, task to follow Cheryl Harris's <laughs> keynote address. Where's Devin? He's trying to escape the room. I'm going to get you, man. So anyway. <laughs> but we've assembled a spectacular group of panelists here who will discuss in various ways the importance of Cheryl's work, whiteness as property, on, uh, across the disciplines. Right? Again, we have five wonderful presentations and not nearly enough time to do each panelist justice, so I will try to keep my opening remarks to a minimum, uh, as well as keep the introductions to the panelists to a minimum as well. You have more detailed bios in your symposium programs. And I'll get to those introductions momentarily. Uh, I think that it's fitting that the final plenary session of the symposium focuses on Cheryl Harris's work on fields outside of law when we consider how the symposium began. Right? So during the welcome and introduction to the symposium on Thursday evening, and Belinda Tucker provided a partial list of the many disciplines that have cited whiteness as property. And in case you missed it, that was a very, very long list. Immediately following her remarks, Devin Carbato again discussed the impact of whiteness as property across the disciplines. So I think it's safe to say it cannot be overstated how impactful Cheryl's work has been. Now, when I first read Whiteness as Property in the late 1990s, oh yeah, I admit I'm a little late to the game. It was late 1990s. But when I first read her work, I had a rather unique, or at least unique for myself, reaction to the project. I felt that most of it was familiar. I felt that all of it was on point. And it still felt very new, very novel, very fresh. Right? <clears throat> At that time, I was doing a lot of reading on historical sociology, social psychology, political sociology, economic sociology that had taken up the topic of race and racial domination and white privilege specifically, but none of those other projects had resonated with me the way that whiteness as property had. Before reading whiteness as property, it had been drilled in my head as a sociology graduate student, right? <clears throat> that race should be understood as the way it gains social significance through organizing social relationships and social structure, but it was only after reading Whiteness as Property that I felt that I even began to truly understand the impact of race and racial domination in America. So I was forced to ask myself, what had Cheryl done differently, right, or better than all of the other scholarship that I had previously read, and admittedly at the time, I thought was pretty darn good, right? <clears throat> So after pondering the question for some time, I started to realize that the argument and the analysis in whiteness as property was so successful and so compelling, in my opinion, because of Cheryl's uncanny ability at both substantive and methodological versatility, coupled with her avoidance of the pitfalls of eclecticism. Now, I understand that usually in the academy we think that eclecticism, being eclectic, is a good word, so let me define what I mean for the terms of my brief remarks. Eclecticism, as I'm using it today, is the practice of picking and choosing epistemological and theoretical principles to suit the convenience of each particular problem at hand. This approach unfortunately fails to develop and refine core concepts capable of directing research efforts right, consistently along the lines that guarantee solutions will remain related to each other by a coherent set of principles. Whiteness as property was a highly general, parsimonious, logically consistent, internally coherent theoretical framework that re uh, resulted in a single body of theory and provided a springboard for anyone, and everyone I would argue, concerned with the causes and consequences of racial inequality. But this of course still begs the question, how was whiteness of property able to achieve this level of generality, of elegance, of coherence? Stated differently, what did Cheryl's substantive and methodological versatility yield? I believe the answer lies in Cheryl's multidimensional conception of race that is a synthesis and elaboration of diverse sociological and legal theories and concepts that have a long tradition in sociological thought. Cheryl's theory provided a more complete description of racialized social structures as well as a more nuanced account of the relational dynamics at play. So why was this multidimensionality so important? Well, we should think about the number of dimensions of a space of experiences as the number of independent options that one has to take into consideration for a complete description of any experience that cannot be merely defined by the combination of those other dimensions. Now let me say that again. I know that was a mouthful. Again, the number 
of dimensions of a space of experience is the number of independent options one has to take into consideration for a complete description of any experience that cannot be merely defined by the combination of those other dimensions. Now, whiteness is properly identified and elaborated key dimensions that define human behavior. The economic dimension, which emphasizes not only the uneven distribution of wealth, but also the uneven uh, distribution of the mechanisms of wealth distribution, for example, inheritance, occupational opportunities, and so forth. There's a relational dimension, defined as the distribution of people to one another and their linkages, linkages in a wider network. There is the cultural dimension, which is concerned with the symbolic and expressive aspect of life and in particular society's notions of conventionality and the good, the true, and the beautiful. There was an organizational dimension, again defined by a group's capacity for collective action and self-governance, and finally a normative dimension that results from the operation of social control, of which law is one example, governmental social control. And this dimension of human interaction is not only concerned with who is respectable and who is deviant, but also their power and authority, that is their capacity for social control. Whiteness is property's multiple, multi-dimensional conception of race, racial privilege, and racial domination skillfully draws from these major aspects of social life incorporates what is valuable, discards what is unnecessary, and demonstrates how these seemingly divergent perspectives can contribute to a single body of theory. So then we ask ourselves, or we should ask ourselves, right? So how is whiteness as property informed scholarship about race and racial difference produced by social scientists, behavioral scientists, and humanists? After whiteness as property was published, scholars outside the law could no longer talk about social privilege and disadvantage and its relationship between law and legal institutions and be taken seriously without engaging Cheryl's work. Right. Whiteness as property has moved us away from monotheorism that has plagued many disciplines. And by monotheorism, I mean a tendency to explain social life and relationships according to one single principle. Economics, social networks, culture, organization, social control, both legal and non-legal forms, have long vied for theoretical supremacy and explaining race and racism in the social sciences and the humanities. Whiteness as property refused to make any of these contenders the ultimate explanation and therefore vastly increases its comprehensiveness, generality, and usefulness. We just have to listen to the ways that scholars in various disciplines have currently defined and discussed racial inequality. For example, institutional racism is a type of power that encompasses symbolic power to classify one group as people as normal and the other groups of, as abnormal. The political power to withhold basic rights from the people of color and marshal full power of the state to enforce segregation and inequality. Social power to deny people of color full exclusion or membership into associational life, associational life, excuse me, and the economic power that privileges whites in terms of job prospects, advancement, wealth, and property accumulation. Another scholar notes that the task of studying racial structures is to uncover the particular social, economic, political, social control, and ideological mechanisms responsible for the reproduction of racial privilege and society. In my opinion, one of the greatest triumphs as whiteness as property, and by no means its only one, is that social scientists who once confidently proclaimed that race is declining in significance or that sociology is really only concerned with one independent variable, and that is class, have now been weighed, measured, and found wanting. Thank you. So now I have the pleasure of introducing our panelists. Again, my introductions will be necessarily brief, and again, you can locate the bios, the more uh, detailed bios in your program. So in order of their presentations, we have George Lipsips. He's a professor of black studies and sociology at UC Santa Barbara. His research and writing encompasses social movements, urban culture, and inequality. George will address how the legal and social power of whiteness as property organizes social relations and knowledge production around the imperatives of white time and white space. To his right, Eric Avila is a professor of history and Chicano studies at UCLA, as well as professor of urban planning at the Luskin School of Public Affairs. He teaches and writes in the areas of urban history, cultural history, and the history of race and ethnicity. Eric will discuss post-World War II period as a critical period in the history of white racial formation and discusses the manner in which suburbanation engendered a more inclusive notion of whiteness through an interlocking set of spatial and representational practices. After Eric, we will have Daria Rothmeyer, is the George T. and Harriet E. Fledger Professor in Law at University of California's Gould School of Law. 
She teaches and writes about the dynamics of law and social systems, focusing on the ways in which legal regulation and social behavior evolve in response to each other. Her work draws from economics, sociology, political theory, history, and complex system theories. She has also recently published a book in NYU Press, Reproducing Racism, How Everyday Choices Lock in White Advantage. After Daria, uh, <coughs> Daria we have Lady Volp. She's the Robert D. and Leslie K. Raven Professor of Law at UC Berkeley School of Law. Her teaching and scholarship focuses on the humanities, citizenship, migration, and culture and identity. Lady will discuss whiteness as property in relation to ownership of creative property with a particular focus on law and literature. And finally, we have Howard Winant, the professor of sociology at UC Santa Barbara and affiliate faculty member of the Black Studies, Chicano, Chicano Studies, and Asian American Studies departments. Howard's research and writing focuses on racial theory and social theory, the comparative historical sociology, political sociology, and cultural sociology of race, both domestically and globally. Howard is also the founding director of the University of California Center for New Racial Studies, a multi-campus research program. And if you look near the back of your programs, you'll have more information about the center. And Howard will discuss the impact of whiteness as property on ethnic studies program scholarship. So thank you for your patience. And we will hear from you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this has been a splendid day. A symposium like this offers us an occasion to express our admiration, our appreciation, our affection for Cheryl Harris, and our deep respect for this article, which has been such a, a fountain that we've been drinking out of for, for 20 years. It's nurtured us and sustained us. It set us on a proper path. I think also looking at this article, offers us an opportunity to think about what is the good work that good work does? Why does a good article matter? In the normal audit culture of the university, the number of citations matter, but that's a kind of surrogate for influence, for changing the conversation, for making the world different than it was before the article appeared. This article has um, a way of marking a moment in time, as Robin Kelly said the other night, so much so that it's become part of the common sense wisdom, part of the problem solving of critical anti-racist thought. And for that reason, uh, the number of citations far undervalue its actual influence. I think of this article's impact on scholarship much like T-Bone Walker's influence on the guitar. That is, uh, a lot of virtuosos who play the guitar well, but if they had never lived, the guitar would still sound the same. T-Bone Walker played the guitar in a way, made it sound like a horn, uh, played those single string runs, and now everybody plays the guitar that way. I play T-Bone Walker for my students. They say, so what? Everybody plays the guitar that way. I said, well, they play the guitar that way because T-Bone Walker made it possible. If T-Bone Walker had never lived the guitar, we wouldn't know what the guitar would sound like. And if Cheryl Harris had not written this article, our studies would be very, very different. And I want to talk today about the use that's been made of this and that continues to be made. Like the playing of T-Bone Walker, you can hear and find something different in it every time you encounter it. Its uh, accomplishment is not over on the first hearing, the second hearing, or the third hearing. As this scholarship has migrated across the disciplines, and it's, it's often been an undocumented migration across the disciplines, and I want, in both senses of that word, uh, and I want to document it today, not for the purpose of repatriation, but for the purpose of understanding what is it that makes original work original? What is it that makes generative work generative? How is it that we're better together than we are apart? How is it that the conversation saves us all? Within law, this article has a particular meaning because whiteness has a particular status, a particular quality in law that it has uh, uh, denotatively elsewhere but not connotatively. And part of what this article focused on 
is not only that property is an outcome, but that it's an expectation. Uh, Cheryl quotes Jeremy Bentham saying, property is nothing but the basis of expectation. She says, whiteness was an object over which continued control was and is expected. And as many people have said over these last few days, whiteness means the right to exclude, the right to control the nature, the pace, and the extent of inclusion. Everybody's included in the Western epistemology, but not everybody has the right to include. And if you have the right to include, you also presume to have the right to determine the quantity and the pace of inclusion as well. And that means you control time, that you not only control whiteness as property, but in this case, time is money. You control money, you also control time. Now, we know from the studies of, of the law that there's a way in which the pace of inclusion, as whites determine it, has a short attention span and a great deal of impatience connected to it. So as Kimberly Crenshaw often points out, the civil rights case is 1883, talking about a law passed in the 1870s. They say, uh, we're fed up with this. You know, how long has this gone on? It's time for the Negro to stop being the special favorite of the law. Now, think about what the law was up until the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, up until the 1866 Civil Rights Act. And so you have a revolution that takes place, and an abolition democracy comes into being that says it's, this is a simple problem to solve. You put the exact force of the federal government behind emancipation that you put in favor of slavery. You simply reverse that, and you've got the constitutional problem solved. Civil rights cases, uh, people who owned slaves, people who went to law school and were taught by slave owners, people who lived in a country whose foundational premises were the preservation and protection of slavery, decide that that inversion should not take place, but that there's simply a temporary inconvenience to whites, that whites have the ability to determine how long will go on. And of course, this has never ended. Those of you who know Missouri v. Jenkins, the, civil, the school desegregation case in Kansas City, you have uh, racial stratification by law uh, starting under the Napoleonic Code in the 1740s in the Missouri Territory. Brown v. Ward comes along in 1954. Kansas City resists it until the 1980s. The late 1980s, they implement a limited desegregation plan. And by the mid-90s, the Supreme Court said, that's it. It's too much. White people have put up with too much. There's been seven years of this. Let's get, get, get things back. <laughs> Let's get back to the baseline norm. And of course, we could do this over and over again. Shelby v. Holder, you know? A Voting Rights Act isn't needed because the Voting Rights Act has been successful in giving people uh, access to the ballot. Uh, this would be like me saying, uh, I have a, a, a medicine that I take. Uh, if I don't take it, I will die. Uh, but since I haven't died, I ought to stop taking the medicine. This is essentially what the Roberts Court ruled. And so there is this impatience because of the presumption of being able to control time. And here's where I think Cheryl's work is doing such lively work today. The philosopher Charles Mills wrote this great article in the Du Bois Review called White Time. And he says that you know, we have a, a situation where our presumptions about who the rights-bearing subject of law, the contracting subject of law is, is simply uh, is racially marked. The representative political figure of the modern period remains the white contractor of social contract theory, not the red aborigine whose land has been taken for the contractual construction of the white settler state, or the black slave who has been uh, contracted over by being bought and sold by the white Atlantic. And so if this subject is at the center, this subject's temporality becomes the temporality of the law. It becomes the temporality of, uh, of philosophy. Uh, we see the way in which white people go through life accompanied by their ancestors and accompanied by their ancestors in ways that other people don't have the ability to do. So in U.S. versus, uh, in Marson versus U.S., uh, a woman raped at a fraternity party at Virginia Tech uh, cannot get justice from the Violence Against Women Act because the Supreme Court says in the Cruikshank decision, the blacks murdered in the Colfax massacre in the 1870s uh, couldn't claim a special injury, and therefore she can't claim a special injury. Uh, in the Arizona uh, immigration case, 
just, just the Scalia says it's perfectly fine uh, to racially profile uh, 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 Mexicans, other Latinos. Uh, it's not racial profiling because after all, there's established precedent. Uh, during slavery, the slave states uh, prohibited the immigration uh, into their state of free blacks. And so because slave states could regulate free blacks, Arizona today can regulate and profile Mexicans and make them lesser citizens. This means that whites inherit the original intent, which of course was not original intent at all, but the, the, the misreading of abolition democracy, making anti-subordination law into anti-racial recognition law, whites inherit that, but minorities do not inherit the real original intent of the 1866 Civil Rights Act and the 13th and 14th Amendments. What minorities do inherit is this long history of whiteness as property. Uh, many of these have been mentioned today. The Homestead Act, the seizures of land by adverse possession, contract buying schemes, racial zoning, restrictive covenants, redlining, urban renewal, uh, predatory lending, many of the things that I think Daria will talk about that she writes about in her book as the establishment of a racial cartel that locks in advantages for whites. The great Cesar Chavez used to say that the rich have money and the poor have time. And what he meant was, even though we might be outnumbered, outspent, outgunned, we don't have to be outworked. But in fact, the rich also have time as well. <laughs> that they take other people's time. They make them serve time. They shorten their lifetime. And they are able to tax not only their wages and their bodies, but put taxes on time by wasting time. So think of shortened lifespan different life stages, impediments to life savings, serving time, stopping time, wasting time. So in terms of lifespan, I, I, I'm short of time, so I'm going to go through this quickly. <laughs> uh, being black means you have a shorter lifespan by 20 years, uh, in, uh, as opposed to comparable places in the same city. Uh, premature death. if. Uh, uh, you lined up and executed 75,000 black people every New Year's uh, Day, you would be doing the same thing that malnutrition and the healthcare system does slowly and routinely. Um, you have every act of discrimination is a theft of time. It produces anticipatory fear, physical stress. It makes you worry that this is going to happen again. It also means that you have a different relationship to place, that, that children uh, of white families are raised in different places than children of black families, that uh, for whites, poverty is only temporary. Uh, for blacks, poverty goes across several generations. If blacks live in a wealthy census district, it's often only for one generation. When whites live in a wealthy census district, it goes on for generations and generations. Uh, inheritance uh, is something that Professor Thaxton mentioned earlier, life savings. Of course, stop and frisk means you can have uh, your time stopped. And the theory is the broken windows policing, if you uh, monitor minor quality of life crimes, you make things safer. But of course, this means people of color are constantly stopped, constantly pulled over, constantly had their lives interrupted. And the idea that if you don't attend to a broken window, that uh, it'll get worse. So if Michael Brown is walking in the street in Ferguson, uh, a street where no cars are coming, you have to stop him, you have to shoot him uh, six times because otherwise something serious could happen. Um, how are we doing then? here? All right. So we have the differences in serving time, uh, the ways in which the operation of the municipal courts steals time, not only through traffic drop stops, uh, being disproportionate, but also uh, people being having to go to court, uh, having to uh, pay court fines. In many of the municipal courts, they say you have to be there in, in St. Louis County, you have to be there at 7, but they close the doors at 645, and so uh, you're then officially late. You're operating on CP time because you didn't get there 15 minutes early. That means you get a bench warrant. That means you get a fine. That means you go to jail. That means you lose your job. That means you get evicted. This is what the control of time uh, is able to mean. Even in clearing up bankruptcy, uh, whites who are bankrupt almost always uh, get Chapter 7, which takes only a few months. 
When blacks are bankrupt, they have to pay, uh, excuse me, whites get uh, 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 much more time to pay back uh, loans. Broken windows policing also means that the costs of the criminal justice system rob the wages of people of color in attorney's fees, bail bondsmen, the most expensive phone call in the history of the world. But real broken windows are not fixed. This is a home foreclosed on, owned by a real estate owner. Uh, NAFA's study is that throughout the country, when black, homes in blacks' neighborhoods are foreclosed on, they're left abandoned, they sit for months and months. When uh, homes in white neighborhoods are foreclosed on, they're cleaned up and taken care of immediately. So you have uh, Dr. King telling us that uh, the real deadbeats uh, are not the people who are perceived to be behind in history, not perceived to be at an earlier stage, but in fact, white America, which has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. As the morning panel indicated, there are activist roots and ramifications of Cheryl's article that are being played out in the streets every day and in political contestation. I hope everyone in this room read the op-ed in the New York Times that Kimberly Crenshaw wrote this summer about the gendered uh, dynamics of the My Brother's Keeper initiative. The group that she and other activists have formed in response to that is called Why We Can't Wait. And they're echoing Dr. King's great book, Why We Can't Wait uh, Against Gradualism, but they're also saying black women should not have to wait to have the needs of black men and boys attended to, and then they get to you. They're refusing to say that, to, to pretty up non-freedom by calling it not yet freedom. Uh, and the uh, imperative that this presents to us is to have a different temporality. Uh, Michael Hanchard in Anthropology, Mindy Thompson full of love, in uh, clinical psychology, Rob Wilson in literature, all talk about the need for us to operate on a different temporality. I want to conclude by uh, relating to you the lesson that I got in how to deal with time. It was from a, a black activist named Ivory Perry, a semi-skilled worker, a high school dropout who turned the grievances and aspirations of his community into collective mobilization. I wrote a book about Ivory. I wanted this unsung hero to be lauded. I wanted people to know how a seemingly anonymous person had made a lot of difference. When the book came out, we were interviewed together in a local television station. And the interviewer said, Mr. Perry, you've done, you're an ordinary person who did extraordinary things. You were ahead of your time because at a time when the medical establishment didn't know there was a lead poisoning epidemic, you were getting black kids screened and tested. At a time when nobody knew there was going to be mass homelessness, you were showing that especially women of color with families uh, were experiencing housing insecurity. You were somebody ahead of your time. I was pleased by this because I wanted to see Ivory get praised, but he didn't like it at all. Every time she said ahead of your time, he kind of bristled. And finally, he just interrupted her. And in words that I think are the best response that we can give to show that we've understood Cheryl's article, <coughs> Ivory said, ahead of my time, ahead of my time, how can I be ahead of my time? This is my time. I'm on time. Maybe somebody else is late. <laughs> So I have the very unenviable task of following the great George Lipsitz <laughs> in my talk. Uh, George was actually a mentor of mine for many years and has been a huge influence on my work. So this is kind of one of those weird scholarly moments when a scholar kind of meets his maker on, on a wonderful <laughs> panel like this. But I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, and thank you so much for coming. And, and thank you so much for the invitation. And, and thank you. Professor Harris for your article, which has opened doors of understanding and revelation for me and my students across 20 years now. So, so thank you for this opportunity. Um, I want to give another perspective on the study of whiteness, uh, maybe a different disciplinary perspective, um, an interdisciplinary perspective, but one rooted primarily in my study of US American history. Um, just to give you some background and perhaps also to shamelessly plug my, my book, 
I just finished a book called The Folklore of the Freeway, Race and Revolt in the Modernist City. And this is a book about grassroots opposition to urban highway construction in diverse communities of diverse American cities. And one of the, the big lessons that, that I hope my book conveyed um, is that white property mattered more than black property in the fight against the freeway during the 1950s and 1960s. Um, and this book extends my work in the history of the 20th century American city. Um, and my work, all of my work, looks at the historic interplay of race, space, and cultural representation. So my study of whiteness and white racial formation is not grounded in the study of the law. It's grounded in my study of American history. Uh, it's grounded in my study of American culture. And I think most of all, it's grounded in my analysis of space, urban space in particular. Um, and I think studying the linkages, the historic linkages between space and race really gives race, racial identity, racial conflict, a, a materiality, um, a kind of brick and mortar materiality um, that I, I think is important. Property, after all, at least the way that most of us understand property, the way that most of us experience property, I believe is a, a spatial process through physical organized space. Um, so as I said, my, my work looks at, at the post-World War II moment in American history. And I, I think this is a, a deceptive time in the history of American race relations. Um, it's often mischaracterized as an era of progressive social change. The age of civil rights, of Brown versus Board, of freedom rides, of Martin Luther King, of black liberation movements, and that of other racialized social groups. And it's a history that, that often uh, culminates with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Um, and, and this is what brought us to a so-called post-racial society. This, I think, is kind of a dominant, dominant narrative of American history in the second half of the 20th century. And yet, if we look at the geography of, of post-World War II America, um, we find a very different pattern taking shape. Uh, taking shape through processes like suburbanization, urban renewal, highway construction, and slum clearance. And all of this happening against the backdrop of a shifting in a geography of industrial production. Uh, urban manufacturers shuttering their factories, moving first to the suburbs, and then ultimately overseas. It's in the 50s and 60s when we see the beginnings of this process we now know as, as deindustrialization. Um, these large-scale processes inflicted a profound political and economic crisis upon the American city, especially upon the inner city, which had been depleted of the jobs and wealth and people that it had hoarded over the past century or so. And left in the wake of this exodus, poor people of color, African Americans and Mexican Americans in particular, found themselves confined within isolated pockets of racial poverty, uh, left to contend with deteriorating infrastructure, police harassment and brutality, educational neglect, inadequate health care, overcrowding, displacement, the list goes on. So how do we explain the birth of the modern ghetto and the modern barrio in the second half of the 20th century against the standard narrative of civil rights progress? How did these spaces harden the boundaries of black and Chicano identity? And how did they spur oppositional forms of racial consciousness? And also, how did new suburban space expand the boundaries of white identity during the post-war period? These are the questions that, that inform much of my research. I, I think a lot about space how space is organized historically in racial ways, from the back of the bus to the front of death row, from bulldozers, barbed wire, and police barricades, where do we go to find the making of race? And how do we make race as a society through a distinct set of spatial practices? Um, so while the urbanization of black and Chicano identity found diverse outlets of creative expression, 
I've written a lot about the suburbanization of white identity after World War II. Uh, this process of white racial identity formation is grounded in the shifting geography of race, wealth, and property, as well as in new sets of cultural experiences and expressions that positioned suburban whiteness as the norm against, all, against which all other identities were defined as deviant, subversive, obsolete, or criminal. And so building on a tradition established by people like Professor Harris, Professor Lipsitz, the post-World War II version of suburban whiteness was firmly grounded in a new regime of property relations which were innovated during the New Deal. The Homeowners Loan Corporation, the Federal Housing Administration, um, these New Deal agencies established a uniform national set of criteria for assessing and assigning the worth of urban property. And the idea was that, that these institutions would help to bring the housing market back on its feet after the crash. Now, this criteria was upheld as rigorous and objective. Remember the neutral man's burden uh, that Professor Carbado introduced us to on, on Thursday. Um, these standards of objectivity, or so-called objectivity, relied upon a historic set of racial assumptions to signal the worth or the worthlessness of urban property to private banks and mortgage lenders. In its standardized survey form that thousands of HOLC officials used to assess diverse neighborhoods of the 100 largest cities in the United States, the first category on their survey form was simply labeled social, uh, meaning that the first question that federal officials asked of a particular neighborhood was, who lives here? And that category of social was broken down into subcategories, uh, four subcategories. There was nationalities, class and occupation. Uh, curiously, there was another subcategory called shifting or infiltration. And then finally, perhaps not surprisingly, there was a separate subcategory simply labeled Negro. Now, while Mexican Americans, Jews, Japanese, Chinese Americans, Russian, Polish, and Swedish immigrants were often lumped together under the heading of nationality or even shifting or infiltration, only African Americans were singled out in their own separate subcategory for their presence in a particular urban neighborhood. So HOLC officials essentially had their own version of a one-drop rule mm -hmm. for property appraisal. The presence of even one black family in a neighborhood was enough to qualify the entire neighborhood as black, therefore assigning a fourth-rate, lowest-grade uh, rating identified by the color red on a map, on an HOLC map of the city. Um, this map was for the exclusive use of public officials and private banks, and this is the process we know as redlining. Redlining entailed disastrous consequences for neighborhoods that sheltered black residents, essentially arresting the flow of investment and new development, exempting these areas from the outward tides of wealth that nourished an expanding suburban periphery. And this suburban periphery thrived under these policies, especially as both the HOLC and the FHA maintained a strong bias against older properties and industrial locations. So the effect of these institutions and their policies essentially channeled public and private investment away from inner city communities and towards racially exclusive, newly built suburban communities on the fringes of the old metropolis. So essentially, the federal government rewarded neighborhoods for being exclusively white and for maintaining traditions of racial exclusion through deed restrictions and homeowners associations. And by assigning worth to the whiteness of these communities, both the HOLC and the FHA encouraged homeowners to maintain racially exclusive patterns of settlement. And this worth would grow through equity and further investment. To live in an all-white neighborhood was thus to enjoy a protected status and to ensure future prosperity. So this was when affirmative action was white, uh, to borrow the, the terminology of the historian Ira Katz Nelson.
Um, African Americans, on the other hand, were essentially locked out from the single greatest opportunity for socioeconomic mobility in American history. Uh, home ownership historically has provided the single most important avenue for wealth accumulation and through the equity built into one's home. And blocked from low interest government backed loans, redlined out by financial institutions, or barred from home ownership by banks, black families were essentially barred from the post war American dream of a house in the suburbs, and with that, denied the opportunity to build wealth that could be passed on to future generations. Meanwhile, in the central city, civic officials, fearful of the effects of suburbanization and decentralization, rallied corporate executives to invest in their downtowns, to bring their headquarters to their precincts, to build skyscrapers and hotels and sports arenas and baseball stadiums and other civic amenities. After much whining and dining and box seats and symphonies and operas, and through promises of tax write-offs and myriad forms of subsidy, city mayors across the nation forged powerful growth coalitions to save the urban core for privatized development. Some cities did it better than others, but essentially they turned the public life of the city into a for-profit enterprise available mostly to all who could pay for it. And they had powerful weapons to do this. Bulldozers and wrecking balls, armies of which demolished the old city in the name of bold federal policies like urban renewal, slum clearance, and highway construction. These policies put into effect by the state comprised the post-war version of creative destruction, that fundamentally capitalist practice of clearing the old to make way for the new or erasing old wealth to create new wealth. And we know that poor people bore the brunt of these policies. That's why James Baldwin described urban renewal as Negro removal. Now, in other academic circles, I've often been asked, why don't I talk about the whites who were displaced, especially ethnic working class whites? Um, well, we know their stories quite well. They've been told many times over uh, in the literature by many famous sociologists, historians, and journalists, many who actually lived through those experiences, yet maintained a Eurocentric outlook uh, in their work. And I realize that the people who ask these questions are largely schooled in that literature, uh, and they share the same outlook, which has had a lasting power over our understanding of this history. Um, but I answer that white ethnic Americans, Jews and Christians alike, had options in the age of mass suburbanization, endowed with other forms of affirmative action for white people, like the GI Bill, or the National Labor Relations Act. They had greater resources to relocate, they had established ties in other neighborhoods, and they had access to the new suburban frontier. They could move up to better neighborhoods in houses that would appreciate in value. But this history of privilege and access is erased by this bootstraps myth of hard work, self-reliance, determination, even religious devotion and heteronormative family values. Mm -hmm. So that's a very general sketch of how urban racial poverty emerged in American cities in the second half of the 20th century, a process of exclusion through the built environment and the property upon which it rests. This is the post-war period. This is the moment that the historian Nell Irvin Painter describes as the third enlargement of whiteness, that is the suburbanization of Jews, Italians, Irish, Catholic, Protestants, the Lakewoods and the Levitt towns of America, which provided a homogenous setting for a diverse population, diverse across class, ethnicity, and religion, but not diverse across race. And so this is where I think it's important to study white identity. Through what means did this motley crew of suburban Americans become white? certainly through the policies of the FHA and the HOLC, certainly through the construction of new physical space, but also through a whole range of cultural practices that linked being white to being American. Studying the cultural production of white identity does not have to be an apolitical act, especially from scholars who are obviously not white. 
but I think it means trying to understand how things are made so that they can be unmade, and hopefully to affect change in the culture to produce new ways of thinking about race, and ultimately to divest whiteness of its entitlements and its propertied investment. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I feel like asking everybody to get up and do the mid-baseball uh, mid game stretch. Um, but speaking of time, um, I want to start by acknowledging a deep intellectual debt that I have, not just to Cheryl, but to Kim, to Lauda, and to all of those that we might put in the 1.0, 1.5 generation, and to UCLA, which I think of as the mothership and those women in particular as my mother, mother's-in-law, um, with, um, with, with whom I have a very good relationship, I would say. And in fact, Cheryl, Cheryl was part of a team that USC very smartly put together to recruit me. I don't know if you remember this. Cheryl and Devin were both at the recruiting dinner, knowing that I would find Los Angeles a very attractive place to be because of their presence. USC included them uh, as part of my recruiting package. Um, <laughs> as a young critical race theory scholar, I, uh, which I'm not anymore, I owed an incredible debt in terms of the direction that my scholarship took to whiteness as property. And in particular, because that article captured this idea of the material sedimentation of advantage. And in particular, it did so with a focus on one of the most important master's tools, as Devin mentioned, maybe even the magic talisman, uh, the foundational concept of property, that foundational concept that underlies the logic of the market. And in taking on this um, talismanic master's tool, Cheryl emboldened me to explore what light other disciplines could shed on this sedimentation process, on the role that class plays, particularly with regard to the modern baseline. And just as Cheryl used this talisman of property to explore the sedimentation of advantage, I was inspired to use economics, and in particular law and economics, to, as, in some sense, master's tools here in the Legal Academy to interrogate the connection between race and class. And so in the book, I used economics, but what I would call political economy, that is, economics inflected, or if not completely colonized, by sociology, history, and political theory to further explore the processes that captured that sedimentation. And what I'm inspired to do now um, is to move beyond the book to become even more specific about whiteness as property, to push beyond this idea of metaphor, and to specify the way in which that modern baseline represents a thing of value. And the idea here is that whiteness is property and has value in the same way that business goodwill is property, meaning it's something you can pass down to your kids and have appraised. And that is the argument that I want to make today, which is that whiteness in many ways has property value because it gives a person a place in a set of networks that are structured by class processes and that contain within them material resources and opportunities that are very important to the material status of the group at issue. So this notion of networks becomes incredibly important. And network analysis is all the rage now as a field of interdisciplinary inquiry, and it's one that I'm quite excited about. So what I want to do is sort of run through the ideas that I sketched out in the book and then push them a bit further in the way that I just described. So I'm trying to manage two things at the same time. So, so this is, in some sense, a graphic depiction of the property value of whiteness. This is the persistent gap in employment that we see over time, ranging from 
1954 to 2013. And what's remarkable is the consistency with which this significant gap persists. Same thing goes with regard to persistent wealth gaps. Although what we see in 2008, of course, not surprisingly, is that the wealth gap grows quite astronomically to reach a level of $236,000 and two thir basically $236,000 that separates white household wealth from black household wealth. And the argument that I make in the book, the central argument, is that these gaps persist over time because racial inequality has become self-reinforcing by way of a series of feedback loops that I now want to re-describe to you today as network effects. And this is, in some sense, the terminology that people use in economics. They call it network effects. And the story that I tell in the book is a story of racial cartel. And it's one that's familiar to people in the non-racial form as a story of what happens with regard to Microsoft. So Microsoft engages in illegal cartel behavior involving tying and bundling and illegal contracts. And that small but important market advantage then becomes, um, through the lens of cartel behavior, self-reinforcing over time owing to the network relationship between the consumers who are buying an operating system like Windows and the software authors that are writing software for that operating system. As more software authors begin to write for the more popular operating system, consumers then want to buy the software that has the widest range of uh, the operating system that has the widest range of available software. And so that advantage snowballs, oops, that advantage snowballs over time so that even in the absence of ongoing innovation, the operating system gains this important competitive advantage that then becomes locked in. And the analogy that I make in the book is a relatively simple one, that we can think of the kinds of historical uh, legislative moves that people have been describing throughout this conference as cartel behavior that affords whites a distinct material competitive economic advantage that then becomes reinforcing over time through this series of feedback loops that I'm going to describe. So to go back to the cartel idea, which I don't want to talk too much about because people have talked about it so much, um, we think of hate strikes, for example, in railroads as an anti-competitive move that give, gives whites higher wages, a material value that's quite important for them. Um, so too can we think of anti-competitive activity. I realize that's not the way that we typically conceive of it, but um, activity by the Klan and White Citizens Council in terms of policing the boundaries of white neighborhoods and white communities as anti-competitive behavior that is in many ways policing the boundaries of the most important economic unit or network and that is the white cartel. And I would um, just interject here with regard to the question of miscegenation as one framed in this way as incredibly important. So interracial loving is dangerous because it threatens to dissolve the cartel or perhaps let people from the excluded competitors into the cartel itself. And so at the end of this era of cartel behavior that we could think of as Jim Crow, we see persistent, we see foundational racial gaps of the kind that we've been describing. Wealth gaps in particular are ones that I like to focus uh, most importantly on. And those important gaps become self-reinforcing over time by way of these network feedback loops that I really want to focus my remarks on. First, family networks. So think of white family networks and the location that a person enjoys being born into this white family network that contains within it, on the average, $236,000 more of wealth than for black or Latino families. And that family network contains within it the possibility of acquiring additional wealth to earn even more wealth. 
by way of parental assistance with regard to tuition and down payments on a house. And as a result, this location in the family network is perhaps the most important form of wealth that a white family passes down to a child, among others. And in fact, 22% of the racial gap in home ownership, at least this was before 2008, is traceable to this difference in parental assistance. What other kinds of network benefits does whiteness confer. Second, with regard to social networks. So one's location in a social network frequently means that one can enjoy the benefits of job referral. 50% of all jobs are filled through word of mouth. So we read in Deidre Royster's book with regard to children who use their parents' social networks. And a significant number of white sons actually start out at the jobs uh, in institutions that their fathers held or uh, their grandfathers. So these social networks end up producing some significant differences, in large part because the social networks contain people who are um, differentially more employed at high wage jobs with opportunities for advancement, but also in part because those social networks have different structures. And we can see from Samson's 2012 book the difference in the leadership networks between a white neighborhood in Chicago and a black neighborhood. And I'll let you guess um, which one is which. Oops, let's see, I'm behind here. There we go. So on the left, you see the black neighborhood. On the right, you see the very well-connected and easy to distribute information. Um, um, I'm sorry, did I reverse that? So on the left is the black neighborhood. On the right is the white neighborhood. And so these networks actually distribute material wealth in a way that um, classical economics fails to describe. Neighborhood networks are an incredibly important part of um, the kind of property that whiteness passes down. So because public schools are, are financed on the basis of local wealth, white neighborhoods with higher property values are able to finance better public schools. Uh, and black and Latino neighborhoods aren't able to finance that kind of education. And in fact, as a result, 60% of white children who leave poor neighborhoods are able to stay out as adults versus 30% of black children. Relatively speaking, the networks do important work. And then finally, institutional networks are part of the property value of whiteness that the book describes. And this includes what I call the founder effect, where the founders, who are largely white and male, attract into the institution a relatively whiter group and more male group that doesn't look particularly white and male, but it will become so as we move through the process. Those who are selected to be employed are even whiter and more male. And those who end up staying on past promotion or uh, other reasons for leaving are in many cases, according to the social science research, virtually indistinguishable from those who founded the institutional networks. So these institutional networks, because their founders are disproportionately white and male, end up disproportionately favoring those who look like them. And so I guess what I want to um, conclude with is to push this argument even further. And that is when people ask to justify affirmative action, race conscious remedies, or the differences in outcomes as something other than a function of welfare, here's the answer that you can give them. White children are born into a set of networks that benefit from Jim Crow cartel networks of the kind that we've described, that benefit from family networks which provide them with college educations and down payments on houses that benefit from social networks that can help them find jobs through their parents' social networks or their own social networks, that benefit from neighborhood networks that finance their public schools with higher property taxes than those in Latino and black neighborhoods, and that benefit from institutional networks that favor them because their founders were white and male in a way that isn't true for people of color. And so I just want to end by encouraging those 
students here in the population to take up this argument with regard to networks. Sumi Cho's work, for example, it does a brilliant job focusing on network analysis. Follow that line of research. Follow the line of research that sociologists have begun to invest and economists have begun to invest in network analysis because it really does help to push the argument far beyond the notion of metaphor to actually demonstrate the way in which whiteness is property. Whiteness confers material value. Whiteness can be passed down to one's children and in many instances one's uh, social friends in a material way that takes into account class and I think that in many ways is the direction forward and the, the, the direction that most potentially effectively uh, recognizes the incredible value that whiteness as property held as a germinal article in the critical race theory tradition and history. Thank you. Um, first, a huge thanks to the organizers of the symposium. It is such a privilege and such an honor uh, to help us celebrate Cheryl Harris and her pathbreaking article. Ten years ago, I spent a fantastic year here visiting and teaching in the Critical Race Studies program. And that year allowed me to see Cheryl up close uh, as a colleague, a teacher, a mentor, and a scholar. And I remain in awe of her brilliance, her power, and her grace. What I'm going to do in my talk is going to be bifurcated and respond to whiteness as property in two different ways. And the reason for this is that I only plan to give the second half of my remarks, but recent events compel me to begin in a different place. So this is part one. I'm going to start with five slides, which show either images or text, which all appeared on Wednesday, three days ago. First, two images, which were both on the same cover page of Wednesday's New York Times. So this is the first. Oops, sorry. There we go. The heading. A four-year-old girl thought to have Ebola lay on a floor covered with bodily fluids at the McKinney Regional Hospital, McKinney, Sierra Leone, last week. So I'm going to read you a little bit from this article, which is called A Hospital from Hell. Where's the corpse? The burial team worker shouted, kicking open the door of the isolation ward at the government hospital there. The body was right in front of him, a solidly built young man sprawled out on the floor all night, his right hand twisted in an awkward clench. The other patients, normally padlocked inside, were too sick to look up as the body was hauled away. Nurses, some not wearing gloves and others in street clothes, clustered by the doors, pools of the patient's bodily fluid spread to the threshold. A worker kicked another man on the floor to see if he was still alive. The man's foot moved and the team kept going. It was 1.30 in the afternoon. In the next ward, a four-year-old girl lay on the floor in urine, motionless, bleeding from her mouth, her eyes open. A corpse lay in the corner, a young woman, legs akimbo, who had died overnight. A small child stood on a cot watching as the team took the body away, stepping around a little boy lying immobile next to black buckets of vomit. They sprayed the body and the little girl on the floor with chlorine as they left. So that's the first image. This is the second, which appeared on the same cover page of the New York Times, under the fold. The heading. At the CrossFit gym in Long Island City, Queens, the gym's owner and coach, Michelle Kelber, helped three-year-old Georgia Costa work out. The title, High Fives, Not High Reps, CrossFit Programs for Preschoolers Focus on Fun. Okay, now I'm going to throw you, show you three more slides. Oops. Um, this first one is about the call for a travel ban on flights from West Africa, which is increasingly being made. And you see here Laura Ingraham's response. The next, this is Thomas Eric Duncan, who's currently hospitalized in Dallas. Um, it was reported recently, today, that he's now worsening and in critical condition. Called Patient Zero, hopefully people know what this is a reference to. Patient Zero in the AIDS epidemic was the quote, promiscuous Canadian flight attendant who supposedly started the AIDS pandemic. Um, um, and is, uh, he is now also accused of having engaged in what is being called Ebola tourism, whereby someone infected with Ebola comes to the US on a tourist visa for treatment. And this is the third. 
Um, this is from um, an anti-immigration think tank called the Center for Immigration Studies. They actually call themselves pro-immigrant and low-immigrant. In other words, they say we like immigrants, but just not too many of them. Um, but this text basically explains, this is a press release they actually issued on Wednesday saying why Thomas Eric Duncan should never have been issued a visa in the first place as a likely visa overstayer from Liberia. In 1987, Joseph Cairns wrote, quote, citizenship in Western liberal democracies is the modern equivalent to feudal privilege, an inherited status that greatly enhances one's life chances. Like feudal birthright privileges, restrictive citizenship is hard to justify when one thinks about it closely, close quote. More recently, Ayelet Shahar in her 2009 book, The Birthright Lottery, calls the unburdened intergenerational transfer of citizenship a form of inherited property in a dramatically unjust world. She argues that birthright citizenship in an affluent society can be thought of as a form of property inheritance. That is, a valuable entitlement transmitted by law to a restrictive group of recipients under conditions that perpetuate the transfer of this prerogative to their heirs. We must twine together the citizenship as property with Cheryl Harris's whiteness as property. Each seems a necessary supplement to the other. There is a global north and a global south, but there is also a south within the north. U.S. citizenship and whiteness mean life, hope, health, security, and safety. A life where your preschooler is tutored in physical fitness for lifelong healthy habits, not a life where your preschooler is sprayed with chlorine as she lies dying on the floor. To ensure this safe, secure, and healthy life, to ensure this life of privilege, to protect these settled expectations, the borders must be vigilantly patrolled against anything that threatens, whether in the form of plague carriers from Africa, children fleeing violence in Central America into the, quote, porous border between the U.S. and Mexico, or the black teenager walking through your residential subdivision. We can thus see the conceptual nucleus Cheryl describes of the right to exclude shared by whiteness, property, and citizenship. The simple question becomes this, whose life is valued? Whose life is more precious? Whose life must cease so that I may feel secure? Whose life is mourned and whose life is called collateral damage? Okay, so here's part two. So here I wanna step back into history and look closely at some of the roots of the relationship between citizenship, whiteness, and property. And this is a new project where I'm thinking about slavery um, through an exercise in intertextuality, by which I mean the shaping of a text's meaning by another text. What I'm reading together is Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and the 1853 case, Stowe versus Thomas, to see what is illuminated by reading them together. Since this is an opportunity to, to pay homage to Cheryl, let me say that her 1996 article, Finding Sojourner's Truth, Race, Gender, and the Institution of Property, is a brilliant meditation which extends whiteness as property to think about racial patriarchy through the institution and concept of property and examining sojourner truth as both person and symbol. As Cheryl says in that article, Sojourner Truth's narrative and legend is a story about property as well as a story that was propertized, that was treated like property, telling of contests over ownership of the embodied self, of property and things, and the property and persons, all framed by the property rules of positive law. So we can also view Uncle Tom's Cabin through this lens. So hopefully people are familiar with what was the best-selling novel of the 19th century. Um, it begins in Kentucky, where slave owner Arthur Shelby, facing large debts, decides to sell two of his slaves, Uncle Tom and Harry, the young son of Mrs. Shelby's slave, maid, Eliza. So here you see Eliza um, telling Uncle Tom and Tom's wife that she plans to take Harry and run away. Eliza, Harry, and her husband, George, flee north, chased by slave hunters. Meanwhile, Uncle Tom is sold down the river where he meets little Eva, whose father buys him um, and brings him to New Orleans where he and Eva share a devout Christianity. Eva and her father die. Tom is sold to Simon Legree, who then murders him with the assistance of two of his other slaves. In Tom's words, quote, the Lord's bought me and is going to take me home, close quote. Through death, his title is transferred to God. Let me now turn to the case Stowe versus Thomas, which raised the discordant vision of Harriet Beecher Stowe seeking to maximize her profit from a work that critiques the business of slavery. 
The suit was bought by Stowe to try to protect the market for her own inferior authorized German translation against a Philadelphia publisher, F.W. Thomas, who had begun to publish a German translation of the novel in the German-American paper, Die Freie Presse. Stowe's lawyers presented her as the creator of the work, despite her previous contradictory claim that God wrote the book, not just that he inspired it, but that he actually wrote it. But for Stowe to assert her property claim, she needed to be recognized as the creator or inventor of the ideas in the book. At the time of her suit, the understanding of the scope of copyright protections was narrow. It was conceptualized literally as a limited right to print copies. Any secondary use of a copy copyrighted text, translation, abridgment, adapt uh, adaptation from one form to another did not violate copyright. Her lawsuit was grounded in a new paradigm of copyright, which sought to protect an intellectual work irrespective of the exact form or medium of reproduction. Justice Robert Breyer's decision in the case is viewed as a swan song of the traditional narrow view of the field. In issuing his decision, Justice Greyer, who was explicitly appointed to the bench as a defender of the Fugitive Slave Act on a court that was one of the first northern stopping places, Philadelphia, for fugitives, used language that, as Melissa Homestead points out, is fantastically evocative. He uses the metaphor of clothing, Tom and Topsy, and public property. So you can see here, um, in part, um, by the publication of these books, these creations have become as much public property as those of Homer or Cervantes. Uncle Tom and Topsy are as much public property as Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. All her conceptions and inventions may be used and abused. According to Melissa Homestead, a draft version inserted instead of may be used and abused, the following phrase, they may, may be made the heroes of poems, which was then crossed out. So I want to argue here that it is significant that it is Tom and Topsy who may be used and abused. Of all the slaves in Uncle Tom's cabin, it is Tom, a shuffling Tom and Topsy with her, quote, inexhaustible talent for every species of drollery, grimace, and mimicry who starred in the subsequent Tom shows, incorporating blackface minstrelsy, which were wildly popular from the 1850s through the early 1900s. This Tom and Topsy could not be made the heroes of poems, but they could become public property to be used and abused. The four stock figures of these Tom shows were Tom, Topsy, Little Eva, and Simon Legree. But what of the other main characters? The quadroon, Eliza, and her husband, George Harris, who in a counterpoint to Tom being sold down the river south, flee north to Canada in freedom. So this is a, from the book. It's called, titled, The Fugitives Are Slave in a, Safe in a Free Land. Mm -hmm. As Randall Miller writes, George Harris, the bright and talented young mulatto, no ordinary field hand, is the foil of Tom, whose destiny rests in white hands alone. George is the master of himself, standing on God's free soil with his wife and child he claimed as his with arms to defend himself, and then engaging in uplift and self-cultivation via university study in France. In Stowe's rejoinder to her critics, who were skeptical of this vision of the ingenuity of a mulatto in A Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin, she wrote, quote, it must be remembered that the half-breeds often inherit to a great degree the traits of their white ancestors, close quote. Playwrights of Tom shows picked up on Stowe's racial emphasis and cast the Harris family as white. Yet I raise George Harris not just to note how he falls out of the afterlife of Uncle Tom's Cabin and its legacy of Topsy and Tom, but to note that he also appears as a creator of property in the volume. George has invented a machine for the cleaning of hemp, displaying mechanical genius. Yet once his tyrannical master learns of this invention, he feels inferior to George, removes him from the shop, and puts him to work hoeing and digging. When the manufacturer seeks to intervene, George, George's master says, it's a free country, sir. The man's mine, and I do what I please with him. That's it. As Oren Bracca notes, when Justice Greyer decided Stowe's case, his views on copyright differed markedly from those on patents. Greyer insisted in the telegraph cases that the object of the inventor's protection was the essence of his invention, which included the application of a principle and not merely the machinery, apparatus, or other means by which the principle was applied. But slaves like George Harris had no access to have their inventions recognized through proprietary rights by Justice Greyer or otherwise, as shown by the case of Ben Montgomery. He was born into slavery in 1819 in Virginia and sold when he was 18 to Joseph Emery Davis, the brother of Jefferson Davis, who became the president of the Confederacy. 
Montgomery was taught to write and read by the Davis children and put in charge of all shipping and purchasing operations on the plantation. A skilled mechanic, he designed a steam-operated propeller which could cut into the water at different angles to provide propulsion to boats in shallow water to address the serious delay facing vessels seeking to navigate inland. He was denied the patent in 1859 on the basis that he was a slave and could not apply for a patent in his own name as he was not a citizen of the United States under the Dred Scott decision. Subsequently, his master and his master's brother, Jefferson Davis, attempted to patent the device in their own name since, as one slave owner put it, quote, no one could rationally doubt that in legal contemplation the master has the same right to the fruits of the labor of the intellect of the slave that he has to those of his hand, close quote. The Davis brothers were also denied as they were not the true and original inventors of Montgomery's propeller. So I think um, in seeing how whiteness and citizenship and property, property intersect, we could supplement Dylan Penningroth's work on the informal economy of property ownership among slaves with thinking about how enslaved persons sought to have their own ownership of creative intellectual property legally, formally recognized. The Harris's fate in Uncle Tom's Cabin makes plain Harriet Beecher Stowe's position on what was to be done with freed slaves. As she writes in her afterward to Uncle Tom's Cabin, these, quote, poor sufferers are to be schooled to moral and intellectual maturity by Christian men and women of the North, and then they are to be assisted in their passage to the shores of Liberia, where they may put in practice the lessons they have learned in America. And here I can end where I began as we circle back to Liberia. So I'm going to end with Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> So this appeared uh, yesterday, responding to a statement by the science writer David Quammen on the Anderson Cooper show. So David Quammen answering calls for a travel ban on flights from West Africa. How dare we turn our backs on Liberia, given that this is a country founded because of American slavery? You can see Limbaugh's mocking response. The debt for slavery is to be paid by getting Ebola ourselves. I read this through Cheryl's lens on the mischaracterization of affirmative action as a claim of bipolar correctness between individual black and white competitors. I will be hurt if you are helped. We see here in Limbaugh's remarks the ghost with which Cheryl closes whiteness as property, a ghost that she writes has haunted the political and legal domains in which claims for justice have been inadequately addressed for far too long. Thank you. I think I'm just going to stay right here. Uh, my name's Michael Omi. <laughs> um, uh, my uh, my inclusion on the on, the, uh, on this uh, panel is a sort of a last minute thing because of uh, Michael having fallen in ill yesterday. He regrets his absence. I want to. Uh, actually take the moment to, <laughs> uh, in respect to the Omi Wine and Collaboration, just announced the uh, recent publication of uh, the new edition of uh, Racial Formation in the United States. It's 20 years since the book has, has appeared. Uh, 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 since it appeared in its last edition, actually it goes back to the mid-80s, so, you know, as I was recently introduced to somebody by a fellow race caller, oh, uh, have you met Howard One? And he's, uh, he was one of the major racial theorists of his generation. <laughs> 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 exactly. So, um, uh, which, which is a good transition because I think what we have learned uh, from Cheryl Harris's absolutely central work. Mad props to you, Cheryl, for all that you have offered us. And from this symposium over these last few days is that the absolute, not only the centrality of the work itself, which I, I, I have been teaching for many years, and I'm sure many of you have been immersed in as well, but the uh, synthet synthetic quality that it, it uh, maintains, which is its ability to sort of um, encompass the ubiquity of uh, racial injustice and racial 
uh, inequality as, as well as to, uh, to theorize, to help us theorize the um, expropriatory, is that a word? Qu uh, qualities of, of, uh, ra uh, of whiteness as property. I, I mean, the, it, it's not simply the fact that um, we're looking at inequality and systematic denial of rights or access to uh, uh, black folk and people of color on the part of white people, but uh, quite beyond that, the, the um, uh, appropriation of resources, again, systematically, even in copyright law, you know, um, that uh, whiteness as property entails. Uh, I, I have to also just plug another work I think is really important. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates' uh, recent article, front uh, cover article in the Atlantic, the uh, case for reparations, which again is, I think, a working out in particular context, mainly in Chicago, of the um, of the implications and uh, the meaning of Cheryl Harris's work. Um, whiteness of property has contributed in many ways to racial studies, in, in every way, to racial studies and ethnic studies. Above all, I would say, or maybe not above all, but in significant ways, uh, Cheryl's anal analysis of whiteness as property highlights and reinforces what George Lipsis has called the possessive investment in whiteness. Her work helps expand the default, uh, explain, I'm sorry, the, the default to whiteness that fundamentally shapes U.S. politics, culture, and social structure. Uh, concepts of citizenship, identity, social and political rights um, are all tied to whiteness. Whiteness confers these things as property on some of us and withholds them to others, not only withholds, as I say, but also uh, appropriates. Uh, and in this way, as has been pointed out, uh, slavery continues in the United States. Um, so race, so Whiteness as property is, in a way, uh, the central story of, uh, of race and racism, but also the key dimension of race law. Uh, I have to refer to uh, Rachel Moran and uh, Devin Carbato's Race Law Stories book here, which they uh, demonstrate, and their authors demonstrate, it's an edited book, that um, they U.S. racial regime has constantly adapted, constantly refigured itself in response to challenges that have been posed, resistance, excuse me, <clears throat> resistance that have been, have been posed essentially to, to whiteness of property. Um, and we can, we have over these last few days gone through so many of the different instances of this. Um, the, uh, one, I think one very important point that we have to take into account as racial studies scholars, as ethnic studies scholars, is the um, persistence even in our own work of a certain kind of, or in our own orientation, our own teaching and research of a certain kind of uh, default to whiteness. Um, for example, uh, sociologist Moon Ki Jung has argued, has written, that our uh, interest in our, our focus, our work on assimil assimilation theory, on our, our interest in integration is inflected by a, cer a certain kind of what he calls a racial unconscious in which um, whiteness, assimilation, implies whiteness. Integration is into whiteness. Um, integration and pluralism, 
to assimilate the two big mainstream accounts of um, inclusion, supposed inclusion in American society, cultural pluralism and integration, the two pillars of ethnicity theories of race, um, are both inflected, I would almost say poisoned, by that um, default property of, uh, white, of whiteness as, well, white, whiteness as property. Um, both integration and pluralism are presumed to be something whites allow, admitting people into, of color into their jobs, their schools, their neighborhoods. Empire, too, is a matter of whiteness as property. How can we, the US, manage the world today? It's so confusing, it's so problematic. In the, how can we manage it in the interest of our companies, our access to cheap materials and energy? and energy, and energy. Our supposedly democratic values. So whiteness as property then demonstrates the normative refiguring of racism. But I think it, um, as Mari Matsuda pointed out and explained to us, uh, it also leads us to, to uh, a radical refiguring of the meaning of race. It's easy to fall into despair, but big things can happen. Big things have happened. Um, massive transformations are possible in national and global society around the kinds of systematic inequalities that we've been dealing with for these last few days. And I think I'll just, um, this may be a stretch, I just want to draw your attention to Germany. I want to contrast Germany with the United States. Um, Germany just made universal, I'm sorry, university education free for all. And of course it has universal health, uh, free access to medical care and health care. It's not the greatest place in every way. Um, there's uh, a very large immigrant population, substantial racialized populations, ethnic Turks, Afro-Germans. There's plenty of racism that may be made in Germany. But um, I want you to think about what reunification of Germany has looked like in the few, relatively short time, a few years since it began, formally began in 1990. Uh, it's now virtually total. Um, what Germany has done in these last, what, not 25 years or so, um, ha, has been a massive, re, has involved a massive redistribution of pro property and social rights, a kind of affirmative action in a way. Um, since the reintegration, well, there I've used the word integration, of the impoverished East, um, uh, beginning in 1990, over a period of 25 years, German reunification has cost 2.5 trillion euros, which is an average of about 100 billion euros a year. That's roughly $125 billion per year for 25 years. And now, as I say, uh, Higher education is free. Unemployment is 5%. Wealth and income distribution, which at the time of 
the beginning of, of uh, reunification was massively, massively stratified, is now much, much less so. All this is happening under the right wing, well, center right, Christian Democratic Party. So why did this happen? It happened because it had to happen. Because the others, well, they're not racialized others, and that's a pretty big difference, but they're propertied others, or lack of propertied others, had to be included. Because the cost of not doing it, of not reunifying, of not investing in this way, would have been much, much higher. And because power concedes nothing without a demand. So, in a certain sense, I don't want to overstate this, but in a certain sense, it's possible, it's possible to imagine the redistribution of wealth, the redistribution of work, the affirmative action, if you will, process on a whole national level um, I, I, that it's possible to imagine the, the uh, generation of something like equality and inclusion that does not involve the uh, destruction or fundamental uh, transformation of identities. It's possible to imagine something like reinventing whiteness as well. I'm not saying it would be easy in the US context, but I think it would be possible in the, uh, in the sense of um, a massive challenge, the massive resistance that would be required to make it happen. That, this is what we're looking for. This is what um, Ma uh, Mari Matsuda and many other people have been talking about here. Yes, it, it may seem utopian, and yet there is no alternative. And in the long run, it has to happen. So uh, let's keep that in mind when the, when the despair or the appalling qualities of, ra of whiteness as property threaten to overwhelm. Thank you very much. If you don't mind, please join me again in a round of applause for all of our panelists. Now, I definitely understand that the day is, has run long, and many of you want sugar, caffeine, both, or some other thing to get you, uh, to get you fired up. But I definitely want to open it up for uh, questions for our panelists. The mics are here. Any questions? I know Devin mentioned earlier it takes a little time for you to warm up. So what I'll do is let me take the, my moderator's prerogative, but I want a little point of departure here and ask, ask the panelists, do they have any questions of one another or even of me? <laughs> Hoping that the answer to the to the latter is no, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you for that really wonderful panel, um, and for this whole conference to everybody who's been here. So, um, I just wanted to really share a reflection on this panel, which I was very excited to attend. I understood the panel as it did very beautifully to. Um, attempt to account for the um, truly uh, transformative impact that Cheryl's Whiteness is Property article has had across many disciplines. And I, as someone who's myself located in the discipline of gender studies, women's studies, feminist studies, I was felt a little bad <laughs> that nobody was on the panel. Um, to talk about the impact that this article has had, had on that field. And I know other fields were not represented also, but this article's had really 
a very profound impact on our field. One that is so profound, it, it is, it's a little curious to me that that wasn't directly addressed. It is certainly true that at the, after Cheryl's article was published, it has been no longer possible to talk about sexism generally and the history of the feminist movement in the United States without reckoning with whiteness. And this reckoning is, of course, very incomplete in the field of gender studies, women's studies, feminist studies. But I do think that sometimes the um, ubiquity of the language of intersectionality, which is how it's often talked about in our field, ha is really serving to mask that the demand is to really encounter whiteness. And because I care about that demand being answered, I care about you know, having the conversation of that field represented as we talk about the article and the disciplines. So um, this is not to in any way diminish the really incisive and um, brilliant conversations we had, but just to say I look forward to having more in the future. Anyone on a panel want to address directly? I think no? Kim and Cheryl can duke it out. That's my <laughs> <laughs> I'm, no, I'm just joking. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I, I can say something. One thing that Omi and I argue in, in, the, in the new book particularly is that um, the impact of the uh, black movement in the post-World War II era, and obviously this has a much longer history going back to Seneca, Seneca Falls and so on, and Frederick Douglass, um, what, uh, was to politicize the social, was to deepen the meaning of politics, and to make it much more experiential, much more um, oriented to everyday life, and, uh, and our notion of the personal is political, uh, normally uh, uh, connected to this work by, uh, this art famous article by Carol, Hanish is also uh, is very much a uh, an anti-racist movement, black movement generated notion. So, uh, with, without trying to argue that there is some kind of uh, direct creation there, because obviously we have ongoing struggles that are, that are, are extremely venerable. Uh, there's, there is a, a certain way in which this politicization of the social, we, we suggest anyway, was something that could not really be undone as easily, could not be re-articulated or hegemonized as easily, although it can indeed be re-articulated too in family values, the right to life, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and therefore, it was a, an extremely transformative dimension of uh, the challenge that the, that the, uh, the post-war period involved. And therefore, it is, is a, a, clear a clear dimension as well of uh, our intersectionality arguments. And you know, again, we're not the original authors of those. But, um, I think it is very important to recognize this constant interplay around how, how, how what's well, often derided as identity politics is actually, or is perhaps, the most innovative dimension of the movements which have shaped us. Do we have any other questions? Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, my question is actually for uh, Professor Worthmeyer. Yes. Um, I, I wanted to know if you could possibly expand a bit on more on social networks and particularly, you know, how do we, you know, begin to take this sort of whiteness as property uh, discussion to the next step and sort of start discussing on how we can uncouple the social networks as being kind of own solely or particularly to like certain types of social networks that are sort of coupled in with this notion of, you know, well, it's historically been that way, so we've been able to gather this social process and sort of have these 
very tight bound up social networks in you know white neighborhoods and sort of start pushing that sort of same narrative into other you know i guess maybe less affluent neighborhoods so that we can sort of expand that into other areas so that people are able to sort of i don't know if it if i would want to say like assimilate but maybe um take up a, a part of that and sort of start you know expanding on it so that the social networks aren't necessarily just in one place so i think the concept of networks has an incredible potential power to complicate neoclassical economic descriptions of people who make decisions as rational actors with only their self-interest in mind and to think about people's decisions as inevitably and irrevocably social and a function both at the input and output stages of the communities in which they are interconnected and affiliated. And so it wouldn't make sense to think about an individual rational actor anymore once you've located them in their networks. And there's a whole body of interdisciplinary research being done now, ranging from health effects, um, obesity, smoking, about the way in which individual decisions are actually quite predictable when you locate the person in those networks. Network dynamics, I think, is an even more promising field because you're able to map the spread of lots of things, um, norms, um, resources, and opportunities through social networks as a way of structuring the likelihood with which people will interact with each other. Because in many neoclassical models, no one takes into account the structure of economic interactions. The idea that the rich always interact with the rich and those networks inevitably exclude people who would very much benefit from access to resources and opportunities. In terms of how one addresses dismantling those networks or using them to the advantage of communities of color, this is a very difficult proposition, one that I take up inadequately in the book. Um, there are a couple of approaches. One is to think about integrating networks. I consider that possibility and ultimately discard it as something that we've thought about and tried and failed at. And then uh, and one for which there is deep political resistance, right, in terms of integrating the networks. The second option would be to actually jumpstart networks for communities of color. And there you can think about things like baby bonds. So Sandy Darity proposes, for example, um, baby bonds as a way of giving children of color trust funds that they get. So this was true in the UK. They gave them 500 pounds, 700 pounds at birth each child. 700 if they were needy. And that money accumulated, parents could match the funds, and then kids couldn't touch the funds until they graduated, and then only for housing purchases, education, or retirement. And in many ways, that's creating the substitute um, using the taxpayer dollar for those family networks uh, of wealth distribution that white children have been beneficiaries of for years. But this is the place where I think students could really do incredible work to figure out not just the description of the way in which networks feature as part of distributing racial power, but the way in which we could restructure those networks in order to uh, dismantle that additional competitive advantage from whiteness. George, also like to comment. Yeah, well, it's just I think you need to think about network effects as well as the networks. And so, uh, poor people, for example, poor whites can live in zip codes where there are wealthy whites, and that means they get a whole host of advantages that even middle class blacks don't get. And so if we had a sense of what network effects were or neighborhood race effects are, we could uh, build on that. And it seems to me we should never forget that uh, it, if networks are, are stratified and segmented in the society, it's because we don't have fair housing, we don't have fair hiring, because schools are segregated, because we don't really implement affirmative action, uh, because we haven't used uh, these uh, two pieces of legislation, the 13th Amendment and the 1866 Civil Rights Act. Was there another question I thought was yeah. behind you? <laughs> Hello. Um, I really appreciated the, um, the various empirical analyses. 
um, that you all brought to the issue of whiteness as property um, because it showed practically how the, the theory, the methodology travels. But I, I was wondering if any of you, and I'm just going to put it out there, can speak to how the theory has traveled. Um, I just, I, I went to law school here. I'm a C I was a CRS student, obviously. I just entered a history PhD program. And there, there are the race people and there are the class people. The division is so stark. I, I was shocked. I mean, it's, it, it's, it seems antiquated. It's so stark, the division. Um, there are spaces where we talk about Marx, and there are spaces where we talk about Fanon. And they're separate with different people. So I, I want, I, her intervention is really significant, and it has not traveled in the way that I would have liked. And I was wondering if any of you could speak to that. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I certainly never want to defend the disciplines and the way they disaggregate knowledge and the ways in which even a subdisciplinary fields uh, seem to live in isolation, you know, from each other because professional credentialing and gatekeeping is often very, very narrow. But even within those fields, I think that there has been an enormous change. And in some ways, uh, I, I can see it because I think I encountered history programs before you did, and I knew what they were like before <laughs> this existed. And um, you know, you think of Earl Lewis's uh, book on Norfolk, where he insists there is not a, a race system and not a class system. There's a racialized class society, and then it's absolutely impossible to figure out uh, the lives of black workers in Norfolk unless you see them as dealing with both and strategically moving back and forth between uh, race-based mobilization and class-based mobilization, because the the property investment in whiteness often leads them out, leaves them out of a purely class-based politics. Similarly, uh, we were talking about feminist studies before. In the mid '80s, uh, uh, Julia Kristeva had an essay called "Women's Time in Signs," and in some ways, it's a good article. It said, "Women's time isn't the same as men's time," but she's talking about time in a world in which there was no slavery, in which there was no empire, and so therefore, she's talking about certain women. Women, not not all women, and uh, ha not having learned that lesson, uh, I think if you look at feminist studies today, as uh, you know, the, our sister here uh, mentioned, they're very different. They proceed from very different assumptions, but the, you know, these things are not going to be uh, lectured out of existence. We have to, in some ways, change the uh, the social conditions are, uh, that people come from uh, to the university and the university's relationship to alternative archives and, and ways of knowledge, temporalities, and understandings. Uh, I, I've tried to argue that in many ways, critical race theory has been most successful in social movement groups mm -hmm. who use it not because they have a theoretical preference for it. You know, they, they wouldn't know, know Jacques Lacan from Chaka Khan. You know, that, that's, <laughs> not, that's not why they pick on it. They pick on it because it's, it speaks to the complexity of their lives. I, I just would like to add, too, I, I think one of the things that you have to consider is that the birth of history as a discipline in the United yeah, States yeah. was a racial project yeah. um, in the aftermath of the Civil War to uh, build a unified sense of white national identity. Mm -hmm. This is where history comes from. Yeah. And there is a struggle in the discipline to uh, find the relevance of, of this enterprise that was born in the aftermath of of you know intense racial conflict and class conflict, um, and I think in the discipline people are still trying to work out those conflicts. But you know the the race versus class debate is is alive and well, unfortunately. Um, but I think because of the work of of Professor Harris, of Lipsitz, and Omi and Wynant and others, we are beginning to understand how class is racialized and gendered, and we can't separate the boxes in a way that was done for the birth of history, mm -hmm. anthropology, um, sociology, you know, and, and those disciplines. And Professor Crenshaw and Pat Hill Collins and a whole lot of other people too. I want to say that the um, uh, center that I direct, the UC Center for New Racial Studies, which is a system-wide project active on all 10 campuses, and some people in this room are very active in it, um, is now embarking on a new project called uh, the University as a Racial Institution. And our idea is to uh, explore uh, 
the range of research that's done on race, the, the range of teaching that's done on race, and the, the uh, p patterns of learning, which is very different from teaching, about race that happen. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very big idea. It's got a, a lot of network analysis stuff built in, big data type of stuff. Um, it's not clear if it's going to be funded. <laughs> but if it does happen, it may give us a chance to uh, look at the university as a whole. And you see, being what it is, is in some ways a microcosm of universities around the country. I don't want to overstate that. There's HBCs and... Uh, and Native American universities and so on. But um, if we can figure out what we know, what we study, if we can figure out how we, what and how we teach it, and if we can figure out what students are actually learning, we, f we think that that might be a major uh, step forward into uh, challenging patterns of racial knowledge, and maybe patterns of whiteness as property could be challenged as well that way. Can I just add that I haven't systematically looked at this, but my sense is that whiteness as property has also been really important to queer theory and particularly to queer as color critique. And there are many people actually have emerged from UC San Diego who are doing this incredibly important synthetic work thinking about, well, how do you talk about all these different dimensions um, at the same time? Um, so oh, just get that up there. Great. Okay. So this was a fantastic panel, along with all of the panels all weekend. So I want to thank you all for this. Um, I want to share an image and um, use it to ask a question. Um, and I think the image has to do with the emotional investment in whiteness that may over. Um, ride the monetary investments that um, we've been talking about and, and how it was at the end of your talk. Um, I grew up in Canton, Ohio, which is one of the scenes of the most, one of the most devastating combinations of urban renewal and highway development um, in the country. So the, the consequence of both of those two policies together was to completely wipe out the black community and to create an industrial park called White Motors that, by the way, was never, ever occupied. Um, Canton, Ohio was one of the cases that went all the way up to the Supreme Court on the question of whether or not you could use eminent domain uh, for private purposes. And the Supreme Court basically said yes. Um, one part of what was left once um, the, the black community was wiped out was um, a church. It was a Greek Orthodox church that was now in the newly populated black side of town. And one of the questions for the parishioners was whether they were going to keep coming to this church or to abandon the church. Apparently the church was deeply emotionally significant. I don't know the specifics behind it, but it was supposedly a replica of a real Greek Orthodox church somewhere in Europe. There were any number of reasons why the parishioners did not want to leave the church, but did not want to abandon the church. So the biggest thing to ever happen in Canton, Ohio, was that they actually came, uprooted the church, and moved it. 15 miles away. This, this took like a three month process of actually taking this church and moving it. Now it was more expensive to take the church and move it. It was obviously more expensive than to keep coming to the church. But the idea was this is ours, this is our property, but more important, this is, we have an emotional connection to this, right? Um, so I, I, this is, this is in my head in part because of some of the logics of what could happen and possibly might happen seem not to fully invest in the idea that many times white people will spend more money to maintain whiteness than logic would otherwise or markets would otherwise suggest. So this is going to go to the question of, um, of Germany. And this is why I want to bring some other people in the room. So we have a project, CRT Europe. Um, every other year or so, we go to Berlin and we try to have um, a retreat. And every year there's a question about where we're going to have this retreat because East Berlin, or what's usually East Ber used to be East Berlin, is the best place to have um, a retreat. 
But it's also the case that East Berlin is still very white. It sees itself as very white. It sees us going into that space as trespassers in this white space. And every time we go there, there is, in fact, an incident, right? So this notion of reunification economically um, in some ways is in tension with the notion of East Europe, um, East Germany integrating into a far more cosmopolitan, racially diverse space. So I would think that some of our CRT Europe people might suggest that the story is more one that is consistent with whiteness as property rather than a more optimistic story about how it may, might play out. So I know we debate a lot, because the last time we had a debate, you were optimistic about the Obama administration. <laughs> and I was like, Howie, what are you talking about? So I feel like I'm saying again, so Howie, what are you talking about? Right? When we talk about Europe and Germany in particular, do we really see that as something that might provide hope for us or, in fact, something that might show us the Europeanization of whiteness as property? Okay, point taken, Kim, first of all. <laughs> I mean, I did say there's plenty of racism left in Germany. I mean, uh, my main point was not about, um, uh, it was to pre not to present Germany as, obviously, as some kind of um, you know, post-racial or something like that. But simply to say that the resources can be found to transform the systematic, comprehensive, almost unfathomable depths of inequality that exist, of property and disparities. Um, Germany is not a richer country than the United States is. Quite the contrary. Um, and I think, yeah, it is true. I have a, um, a bias towards optimism, and it's, it's hard to sustain. It's hard to sustain. It's hard to sustain in the, uh, in the uh, later years of the Obama administration. It's hard to sustain in the, you know, the third day of um, this symposium because it, the, 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 the evidence is so massive of the systematic, as I say, the systematic, not only uh, denial of rights and uh, uh, access, but the ex appropriation of resources. Uh, from black folk and from other uh, peoples of color as well, but most especially from black people in, in respect to any area you want to name, convict leasing or uh, uh, redlining, I mean, all the things we've talked about. Um, so I, 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 I'm trying to hold on to something there, and maybe that's an emotional thing of my own. I I mean, I also wanted to speak to this notion of emotional investment versus economic investment. And I think it's incredibly important for us to acknowledge the way in which those are mutually constitutive and mutually supportive. So Rose Helper has done this fantastic study of real estate brokers in the 50s and 60s who stood to gain buckets of money if they were willing to cross racial lines. And in their interviews, they talk about this deep emotional affiliation at an identity level with the folks that they were potentially going to uproot with absolutely no recognition, of course, of the emotional effects uh, at a group and individual level of the people they were keeping out. But they spoke about guilt and blame and um, and, and in many ways, the notion of a cartel gets at this idea that you have to be willing to persuade cartel members to take actions that are against their economic interest. And that's where the emotional investment work can become deeply supportive and constitutive. Okay, uh, we have two more questions, and then I think we'll wrap up. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, I think that there is, I'm hopeful, and because there is a lot of intellectual thought here, a lot of brain power, and I believe that there are many things that we, perhaps all of you could come together and, and figure out a way to stop racism. For instance, I have traveled to 49 countries, and I realized the power of Hollywood. And the very same way that after the Civil War, this um, form of racism was uh, established, maybe we have uh, vehicles in which we could begin reclaiming things back. And all of you have amazing thoughts amazing ideas, and if we would put them together, think outside the box, try things that we have never tried before, I think that we're into something. Thank you. Well, I want to join everyone else in thanking the panel for a wonderful set of um, ideas and uh, perspectives, um, and also thanking you for bringing together all of the work that we've done over the last couple of days. I did want to say something about um, social networks, which, of course, is this new sexy way of looking at uh, interrelationships and also at the way in which uh, material assets are passed uh, between people, between, uh, in, within groups. Uh, and I guess my point is this. Uh, I think, in some sense, thinking about uh, the uh, barriers to employment as a function or even as partly a function of social networks takes the uh, burden off of um, public policy and takes the issue outside of uh, public, you know, the public realm and places it in the private realm. We all have social networks. We love our social networks. Our social networks are what we, you know, what make us what we are. And nobody wants to abandon their social network. And no one thinks their social network is in any sense uh, less valuable or less supportive uh, than anybody else's social network. So, you know, in some way you kind of, uh, but for, there's no space for legal intervention. There's no space for public intervention in this new idea that uh, wealth is passed down and, and uh, entry access are all passed down through social networks, which we cannot, we have no legal ability to, uh, public ability to disrupt. I'm not sure I agree with that. So I can imagine a space for government intervention in which a company that is predominantly white is told, you can't use word of mouth hiring until you've reached um, a certain diversity level because at that point you'd, you'll be able to draw on the networks of existing employees. That is, you have to use more formal processes and and one can imagine the government creating those spaces, those um, digital networks, or because we know the digital divide is real, other forms of uh, networking in which uh, the networks people draw from uh, for hiring purposes are more diverse. Having said that, I completely agree with you that there is a way in which focusing on social network analysis really elides far more um, trenchant public policy questions, and, and it certainly isn't to suggest that social networks captures the job uh, slash labor issue with regard to race, but merely to illustrate one way in which social networks actually play an incredibly important material role. I, I will say, just to shamelessly plug something other than the book, um, on October 24th, uh, at 6 o'clock, it's a Friday, at the Fisher Museum at USC, there will be a book event at which Glenn Lowry, an economist from Brown, Tom Segru, a historian and sociologist from Penn, and Jed Purdy, a law and political theorist from Duke, will be hopefully tearing apart the book, making precisely the kinds of um, critical arguments that you're discussing. and. Um, Find me on Facebook, and I'll send you an invitation. Uh, and I would love it if Los Angelinos showed up uh, to continue this conversation. But thank you for the comment.
Yes, Lena, the director has some closing remarks. <laughs> I have to say, every time I come up here, the sea of faces makes me so happy. I was, if we had time, I would have each of you come up here and look, uh, but I don't think we do. Um, but it's just so amazing to see so many, um, so many people. People have come from not only all over the country, but from all over the world. We've had over 300 people here um, over these last two and a half days. Um, just amazing advocates, scholars, our alums, our students. Um, it's been incredible. I have a few thank yous just to say uh, before we end. Um, as Cheryl had already thanked, um, we have amazing staff. Um, Rusty Clavoner, who you've probably seen running around outside, has been incredible and has worked really, really long days um, these past few weeks. Brenda Kim, who, have you seen, who you've seen at registration, has um, really, really managed that process well. And I hope it's been as painless as possible. I know it's been a little bit of a lengthy registration process. Uh, but thank you so much for um, helping us with that. Um, we have had videographers who have also been working <laughs> really long days here. Um, so thank you for helping us capture these moments on film. We've had over 50 student volunteers um, who have really just um, just shown and um, have not only helped us, they've moderated panels, um, they've been timekeepers, they've helped with logistics, they are decorating a beautiful re reception outside, um, they've planned some amazing, um, some amazing surprises later on this evening, um, and they have just been fantastic. And of course, um, I'm probably forgetting a lot of people, but of course, our incredible CRS faculty. Um, and of course, Cheryl Harris, who's been the inspiration for all of this. Um, but we are not done celebrating her work because really it's not a proper celebration without some wine. So we will be going outside for some wine. But before that, I would really, really, really appreciate it. As you know, um, that it takes a lot of planning to put on a symposium of this nature. And we really, really would appreciate your feedback so that we um, can know what went well, what you would like to see in the future. It really helps us. Um, so in your program, if you wouldn't mind taking out your evaluations, filling it out quickly now, I have two students, Maya, Corey, would you help collect them also? Um, who will come around with envelopes before you leave and collect um, your evaluations. And um, also, I would really appreciate it. Um, we've had facilities also working overtime, and they've been fantastic. But if you wouldn't mind helping them out, I know these trash cans are full, but there are, are there's new trash outside. So if you just look around, and if you see any trash around you, if you wouldn't mind helping us out and picking that up, that would be wonderful. Um, and after this, we invite you to our reception, which will be in our very transformed law school courtyard. So, um, and I hope to see you there and we can all raise a glass to Cheryl. And a, another, another tremendous round of applause for Jasmine herself. <laughs> she is, she's been absolutely terrific and this event again would not happen without her. So again, thank you Jasmine. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So thank you. Nice meeting you. Yes, we'll have to grab one. Absolutely. <laughs> I'd love to. Thanks for announcing that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm actually.